All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to invite Dr. Maha Aziz to the show. And uh, Dr. Maha is in New York. How are you doing? I'm great. It's so nice to connect. Yeah. And and Dr. Uh, Maha is investigates global risk and prediction in her work as a professor in the MA International Relations Program at the New York University Graduate School of Art and Arts and Sciences, and as a risk expert for the World Economic Forum, a multiple author. Uh, uh, in 2019, uh, you released Future World Order, and you just released uh, a global spring which is predictions for a post-pandemic world. And that's what we're going to talk about today, uh, Maha. And I'm, I'm fascinated about this. And it just so to, to maybe go back to the genesis of the first book and then the second book, I mean, how they came about. Sure. So my first book, Future World Order, really reflected on the fact that in the last decade, we've seen this uh, global legitimacy crisis emerge where certain norms uh, were disrupted or the status quo was disrupted geopolitically, politically, economically, and socially. Uh, so for instance, in terms of our geopolitical structure, there's been a big question mark in the last decade. We've been challenging US hegemony uh, even before the, the Trump years. And I think now going into a Biden era, there's still a big question mark as to who's in charge. Uh, from my perspective, it is a leaderless world, which creates uh, more risk. Uh, additionally, again, if we reflect on the last decade and what we'll see going forward is this crisis of political legitimacy. Beyond the Arab Spring region, and since that happened, we've seen challenges to the political status quo in most parts of the world. This growing sense among citizens that there must be a better way to govern. And, and that's why we've seen these bursts of citizen-led unrest against governments, their policies, certain leaders in every region. Again, I, I think this will persist uh, as we ease into a, a post-pandemic era. I also think it's important to realize that, again, in the last decade and going into the next decade, we have really been in the midst of a identity crisis, mm -hmm. what I call a global identity crisis, where you've seen this trend of, of hate, of xenophobia, of extremism, the evolution of hate from Islamist extremism to Buddhist extremism to Hindu extremism and far right extremism, of course, uh, as well as this, this dangerous xenophobia that, that has persisted during the pandemic and again, we'll, we'll continue uh, going forward. And it's really, it's really this larger question that I think most citizens, most countries have had to deal with. Are we globalists or are we nationalists? Do we care about the other? So I, I, I hate to be so negative, but if you apply a global risk framework, these trends have been building for over a decade. And, you know, many of us tried to blame President Trump for so many of the problems we, we faced in the last few years. But again, these are uh, decade long trends that have been uh, growing. And I don't feel frankly that we have the leadership to really tackle any of these issues uh, in the near term. And, and that's really the crux of my first book, uh, Future World mm -hmm. Order. And I, I also did yeah. go to how tech has exacerbated a lot of these trends but could be part of the solution going forward if we embrace um, the ideas of certain tech billionaires and um, and just technology itself. Uh, let, let me let me just ask you let me just ask you a quick question on on that uh, because I mean there's there's definitely there's definitely a conflict in the world as you said I mean there are there are globalists who want you know greater integration transnational all of that and there are on one side, and then there are, as you said, you know, nation states or nationalists, or there's there's a trend, uh, you know, s separatists in in various regions. So there seem to be two very, uh, two very um, counter forces, if you like, and um, and part of the problem, I'd just like to get your your concept on this, is that I think the 
the globalist agenda has come off as, a, as an extremely elite one and kind of left people behind. And, and there's been real economic impact. I mean, we know in our own country here that the Rust Belt is a result of that. But um, so there's a massive, I think there's a massive divide there in or, or disconnect. So how do, how, do you, how do you bridge that? Because it sometimes feels like you have one group of people who are just saying, here's what, here's what we think, you, the whole world should operate like this. And here's a group of other people saying, but in my this this is this is terrible for my daily life yeah i think i agree with you i think you're spot on uh, that there has been this growing inequality uh in fact if you again if you reflect on the last 10 years we've seen how uh the citizen-led pushback against globalization led to this populist agenda uh, i think what we'll see longer term is that the populist agenda doesn't necessarily give people what they want either and, and what we're going to continue to see is a growing number of people who make up the precariat class. And I'm borrowing this idea from a, a well, well-known SOAS economist uh, uh, in London, uh, Guy Standing, where he, he's talked about this, that what we've seen in, in recent years is this growing precariat class, people who have been left behind, for instance, by globalization, mm -hmm. they've fallen through the cracks and they have not been able to cultivate a strong occupational identity because they're jumping from one temporary opportunity to the next and and again they are falling through the cracks and i think that was uh that was perhaps amplified during the pandemic where you saw more people feeling that um uh that they would be left behind and <laughs> no it's fine he's a, he's agreeing <laughs> strongly about this too. That's my rescue yes. dog. <laughs> um, and, um, but as I was saying, uh, so I think during the pandemic period, we, we also have seen that uh, many people have felt frustrated and, and finance ministers around the world, despite these massive relief packages that they've offered us in different contexts uh, during this period, they've said openly that we won't be able to help every entrepreneur. We won't be able to help every small business owner. And and I think this is, you know, there's no easy solution for this. I think to a certain extent, governments tried or and are trying, but this is there's no near term fix. I think longer term, what we'll see, and I, I touched on this in my first book as well, Future World Order, is that we were already headed for uh, large scale unemployment due to automation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think that automation unemployment cloud has been discussed significantly by by a lot of these activist billionaires, even before the pandemic, when many of them showed their generosity or tried to uh, develop ventilators or help with the vaccine and fr frankly come to the rescue of ineffective governments. Uh, they were already discussing this longer term threat to our stability, this longer term risk that over 40 percent of us everywhere in every country will likely lose jobs to automation in the next 10 to 15 years. And to quote Jack Ma, I think he said something like, you know, there'll be more pain than happiness in this period because governments are not fully, um, they're, they may be aware of it and they're part of the AI race, automation race, but they're not fully appreciating the effect this will have on the average person. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it's, you know, sort of building on what I said earlier, that we have this crisis of leadership, crisis of political legitimacy. You've seen a lot of these activist tech billionaires, particularly here in the U.S., try to offer solutions and to encourage governments. This was pre-pandemic. Uh, and think about what strategies might help ease this transition. There was one, uh, one man named Sam Altman of Y Combinator who launched a pilot project in California to see the viability of UBI, universal basic income. We've seen others like Richard Branson suggest that AI firms in the future should be taxed the most because they'll be the most profitable and that can be used towards supporting those who uh, lose their jobs to, to automation. So I think you know this, this idea of inequality that we've been talking about for over a decade because of globalizations um, uh, pitfalls, it's sort of, it, it's now, uh, uh, it's going to bleed into this larger discussion that there are more people who are falling through the cracks because of automation. And of course, let's face it, we don't know what the post-pandemic 
economy mm -hmm. will look like when you throw in the added pressure now because of the sanctions against Russia, against Russia and uh, the rise in uh, food prices, given the, the situation in Europe, there's going mm -hmm. to be a lot more anxiety and frustration and again, more precariats. And that ties mm -hmm. in more to my, my next book, the sequel. Uh, of yeah. Just 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 let me ask you one question there, because I do I do think it's it's important, as you said, is, uh, you know, faith in leadership. I think I think this is a fair statement. And you can correct me if you don't think it is. I think the pandemic definitely showed the the how the paucity of leadership across the globe, yeah. political leadership. I think we need to be so much more careful about, uh, you know, who who runs countries, who who are economic ministers. I mean, we have sometimes you have you seen like economically illiterate economic ministers in countries and so and and this and I think this is the often the feeling of like so-called ordinary people is it, I think the pandemic has taken this you know taken the scales away from many people's eyes and they've gone much we're in not everybody clearly but a lot of people like we're, we're, we're led by incompetence mm, definitely I it's sad it's sad to see that you know despite having gone through this massive crisis where we could have all come together, our world leaders could have come together and tackled this in a better way. G7, G20, the international community of leaders, we failed, they failed us. And, I, and again, it's really just building on what we had before the pandemic, where this question mark about who's in charge. The post-Cold War era, um, that's been over for a while, right? The, the post-Cold War mm -hmm. era that was led by the US um, that's been over for a while, even though many are saying that now it's over because of what's happened uh, in Europe. But it, this, uh, the challenge to U.S. hegemony has been with us for a while. And so we shouldn't be, it's not so surprising that um, during the pandemic, during this massive crisis that our, our world leaders fall, fell short. I think right now it's impressive to have observed that the world has come together with regards to the Ukraine crisis and in their response to Russia, I think President Putin likely did not anticipate that. Uh, but at the same time, my feeling, and this also comes up in our top 10 risk lists uh, that mm -hmm. my grad students and I collaborate on with crowdsource consultancy Wikistrat every year. And this year we'll be sharing it through the World Economic Forum. Um, and well, this is a point that we raised that, okay, we're united around a common threat right now in terms of President Putin and his actions. But the reality is, as we ease into the post-pandemic era, we'll, that unity will likely be, unfortunately, short-lived. And mm -hmm. what we'll continue to see is the resurgence in the non-state actor. We've seen citizen activists rise up during this period. We've seen, as I mentioned, activist billionaires try to uh, recurrently fill the leadership gap. Um, I think the only world leader who is of note at the moment is probably President Zelensky of Ukraine. The way he has spoken to the world and mobilized um, his country to fight this uh, fight in the war. And uh, I think that's really remarkable. But again, this unity, the sense of um, the sense of community will likely mm -hmm. fall away when we transition to other global challenges. Yeah. For instance, and 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 let's I was just going to say, and let's face it as well. I mean, there's unintended consequences too that may end up with the China, Russia, India, even um, access and a a a you know two two if you like two economic blocks. Exactly, and I, I mean, you know, I think what we'll what we're going to observe this decade is is still a leaderless world, but it's gonna be perhaps more defined by great power competition, like the countries you've mentioned. And I think mm -hmm. right now we're seeing the US or the West versus Russia. Um, and of course, uh, there, there's, you know, we, we have to wait and see how this plays out. Will this trigger conflict elsewhere? Will President Putin uh, engage in other, other uh, you know, in invading other countries? I know Moldova has come up a lot in terms of analysts speculating that could be next. But beyond that, I think we'll we'll again see more U.S. versus China competition brewing. President Biden has been very clear uh, that his agenda is to make sure that the U.S. beats China. He's been very open about this. And 
so we should expect that element of great power competition to continue, tech war, trade war, and, and, uh, and so forth. And lastly, I think what's most significant, and this has played out recently, is that we will see a great power competition involving the US and China and Russia, who have mm -hmm. formed a strong economic military partnership. In fact, mm -hmm. it was just before the Ukraine invasion um, during the Olympics, I believe, where President mm -hmm. Putin was in China and met with his counterpart and they announced a partnership with no limits. Uh, mm -hmm. So this autocratic alliance um, versus a democratic US will, will be prominent, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. And even though China has not offered military aid, as far as we know, to Russia, they have provided a financial lifeline mm -hmm. uh, during the current conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this this dynamic could play out. And and both China and Russia's leadership have said they want to reimagine the world order so it's not defined or driven by democratic values. So they're not mm -hmm. hiding their agenda, although, of course, they should be reminded that there's a crisis of democracy here in the U.S. <laughs> and that perhaps you know, we haven't had an international system driven by democratic values in a while. It, uh, yeah. but and, and, the, and the other thing, too, is, I mean, if you look at the, you know, India and China have had conflict, you know, over the last while over border things, they seem to be looking to come to some resolution about that. And so if you threw India and China and Russia into the mix, you suddenly have, I mean, a vast population. I mean, you know, you have the vast population in this block. So... That's, exactly. The other thing I wanted to ask ask you about was, here's, and these are interesting questions that I really want to get your take on is, we seem to have defaulted into a binary world, right? You're either one thing or you're the other. We've lost the power of nuance. We've lost the power of, of, of you know, taking the best of things. Everything always seems to now come down to a binary choice. You're either for this or you're, if you're not for it, then you're completely against it, right? There's nothing in between. And that's my biggest fear for the future is that we have, we think we're so sophisticated. We've got all this technology, we've got all this stuff and we're so, you know, sophisticated, we're so well-educated, all of that. And yet we fall into false binary choices all the time. Yeah, I, I see your point. I, it's sort of, you know, like I was saying earlier, are we globalists or nationalists? It's as though we've mm -hmm. had to make yeah. that judgment in the last uh, couple of years. And I, I don't know why, you know, why has this emerged? Is it because we have had had uh, a lack of clarity about who's in charge? We're not sure if this is a U.S.-led world order or if this is a multipolar world. There's no consistency. And and that's sort of been a a, a strong marker of this uh, of this post uh, post post Cold War era that I think is dangerous, and it it's created opportunities for uh, for a country for certain actors to be more aggressive, and and perhaps not face the consequences. So I, I think um, it does bleed into heightened risk. But I think you touched on this point about tech, and mm -hmm. uh, I think what's interesting, you know, everyone is aware that a major challenge in the last few years that will continue is the, the competition or the challenge between government and big tech. You know, we're not, we want big tech to be regulated. And, um, you know, recently there's been a lot of debate about why big tech took steps to ban Russian state media on its platforms, but they didn't do enough in the context of say Myanmar, where certain state sponsored mm -hmm. groups have promoted hate and very and very negative again. Yeah. Against or, or let's be honest here, the the Iranians leadership can go on and start talking on Twitter and start, you know, calling for, you know, the death exactly. and destruction of America and nothing happens. Exactly. So I think, you know, that will continue regulation and how do we, you know, how do we deal with these big tech companies? But I think what's interesting to note is that there has been a reaction. We've seen big tech uh, be challenged with the, with the onset of decentralized tech. Uh, in terms of everything from decentralized web to decentralized finance and decentralized currency. Um, so I think in terms of the next phase of the tech wars, yes, big tech versus government, big tech versus civil society, but there's still a big question mark about how um, these decentralized tech elements will play out and to what extent they could be hijacked by hate groups, by 
um, you know, inter or could facilitate corruption, theft. Um, the uh, the IMF has, you know, raised a red flag recurrently, saying that uh, cryptocurrency will have a negative impact on the global economy. On the other hand, the blockchain industry is going to be worth a one trillion dollars in the next few years. So there's a big um, there's a growing tension as to how governments are going to manage this digital space that, frankly, mm. can't be regulated. Except if yeah. you ban it, you know, like China, for instance, has banned cryptocurrency, um, uh, and and Russia, days before the invasion, gave the impression they were going to ban cryptocurrency, and then uh, just a day before they they reverted back to their position that they'll allow it, and I guess it it's working out for them because yeah. they, they need that extra. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's in, it's interesting, isn't it, that crypto is kind of another, if you like, front in this. Um, if you like this, almost like this cultural war or um, because if you think of the things that have happened recently in the banking sector, right, you know, you had in Canada, you know, the truckers getting their accounts seized, all of this kind of thing, you know, so that has played into people going, OK, well, I need to get out of the the banking system because hey, maybe maybe it's truckers today, maybe it's me tomorrow. Who knows? You know, who knows what happens? Whereas at least with crypto, I have some sort of like autonomy. And, and it bleeds into this, you know, it, it, it goes back to this idea of this crisis of legitimacy. We've lost mm -hmm. faith in the status quo or in our governments or in the institutions that were supposed to look after us. And, and that's why it's given way to these decentralized elements like cryptocurrency. So, you know, it, it's it's hard to see how this will play out because, again, it it's the fact that it exists pulls away power from government and it bleeds into this recurring crisis of political legitimacy. Um, so it's it's going to be interesting to see how this evolves. But um, but definitely, I mean, you know, we can't ignore these additional elements. They do have an impact on uh, on uh, global risk and how life is going to unfold. And they may have more impact than the policies of our own governments, which is uh, which is uh, worth noting. Yeah. So, um, so as as we as we start to as we start to emerge from the pandemic, as you said, there's still a, well, we're not even in agreement whether we're out of the pandemic yet. So, I mean, there you go. We can't even agree on that. <laughs> um, uh, as we start to emerge, I mean, I think there's there is a lot of residual things that that have that are coming out of this. And as you said, I mean, there's you know there's the split between politicians and and the people this small yeah. business versus big business let's face it i mean during the pandemic here in california they closed all the small businesses but left all the big box stores mm -hmm. open and lots of small businesses went out of went out of business lost everything so again it always we're, we're we just keep seemingly to to set up mm -hmm. these david versus goliath sort of mm -hmm. situations unfortunately you know david doesn't have a sling this time around um but how do we get how do we get beyond that because i feel like that's happening in almost everywhere we're just we're just pitting like power against lack of power mm. that no that's definitely a, a dynamic that ha that is playing out i i'm not sure what the near-term solution will be I, until our governments are able to um regain legitimacy in our eyes i think this this push and pull between citizen and government or small business, big business, et cetera, I think that will persist. I think, you know, since I've been so negative, if if we were looking yeah. forward about what could be, what could help us in terms of uh, the global economy and just how the world order evolves, uh, I think we obviously should put a lot of emphasis on uh, women playing a greater role in the economy everywhere. They should be working more. I think it was a McKinsey study back in 2015 that famously said that if we have more women in the workforce, it could add $12 trillion to the global economy. And there's all this discussion. There's For the for years, we keep hearing about future as female. Well, you know, the future needs to be now. The global economy needs help. So governments and others should be facilitating that more uh, the role of women in the workforce. Additionally, we know that the nature of work is going to continue to evolve mm -hmm. automation, but blockchain uh, is is not going away, right? And uh, I think it was just a few months ago that PricewaterhouseCoopers said that, um, you know, 
focusing on the blockchain could add about a, a trillion dollars to the global economy. So we know where we need to focus our energy. I think, um, speaking of energy, I think going forward, <laughs> Uh, there's 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 going to be more emphasis on climate tech. I think already there's been uh, over eighty billion dollars just in the last two years uh, that's been invested in this space, and it's it's obviously important for uh, for more um, climate tech entrepreneurs to be supported through VC or government funding or whatever it is. But I think what will be a game changer for us in the future in terms of elevating more of us, more people out of poverty, giving people more opportunity is going to be satellite internet. I I don't mm, know yeah. if you've heard about Starlink, um, you know, that's the, it's under SpaceX, Elon Musk's company. And recently it's come in the news because he, after being, uh, after receiving a tweet from the foreign minister of Ukraine, he, uh, uh, for, for support with sat with internet, he immediately sent his infrastructure to to the war torn country so that they could have uh, un, undisrupted access, and it's been critical, right, for for mm -hmm. the Ukrainians to have a voice on the global stage. But if we think beyond just that, beyond just a conflict zone, if we were to introduce satellite internet in uh, rural areas, in develop in other developed markets, yeah, yeah. developing markets. That can definitely increase opportunity, education, uh, employment. In a way, it could also be a way to re, well, reimagine the social contract because mm -hmm. governments have had a bad habit, even in democratic environments, to clamp down on the internet when people are getting out of control or there's a major issue that needs to be kept under wraps. And, um, and so if you have satellite internet, the assumption is that it can't be blocked as easily by by the uh, by the government. So this specific technology in this decade, if it continues to evolve in the way that Elon Musk seems mm -hmm. to be suggesting, it could be a game changer for education opportunities, employment, and in terms of strengthening democracy, governance. Uh, I, I think I think yeah. it's possible if if only this you know if this can be. Um, if this continues, I think it will be good for all of us and it'll be a better post-pandemic era for all of us. Uh, obviously, there's also sensitivities about having so many low-lying satellites uh, to be able to do this. You know, then you have space junk and yeah. that's, there are issues <laughs> there too at the onset of yeah. the discussion of space wars. So I... Yeah, no, I, I, I know, but but I, I will absolutely 150% agree with you there. And in fact... Um, when was it? it was quite recently, actually, we were out uh, on a quick family vacation out to Joshua Tree, which is in the high desert here out in, um, out in California, um, staying in a very remote place. And it had satellite Internet. Fantastic. I did an interview from there. No problem at all. Uh, but, to your, but to your point, um, I think one of the things to come out of this. So during the pandemic, people realize there is a lot of work that can be done virtually, right? Even people who are virtual working skeptics, right? They they realize, okay, it can, for knowledge workers, for a lot of things, it can be done remotely. So to your point, if you, if you have ubiquitous, if you like satellite, internet and in rural areas across the globe, you, not only are you, not only are, will you create opportunity, but opportunities for people to live and earn money in their communities, not to have to. I mean, we have all these problems of immigration and migration and all of that. Wouldn't it be great if people were migrating by choice, you know, just because, okay, that's where I want to go out of choice, as opposed to out of necessity, if they had the choice to be able to work and prosper in their own communities because the technology allowed them. Exactly. I, I think, you know, we just need to hope this, that Elon Musk continues to do this and <laughs> that it's, it's, it's welcomed by governments, uh, uh, around the world, so we'll have to wait and see. But uh, I think you know the only other point that I I wanted to share was that it's we've had such a fractured global community during the pandemic, as you know. I mean, mm -hmm. we did come together, as I mentioned, but it was really encouraging to see, despite the pandemic, that people around the world rallied against racism after the George Floyd uh, killing that happened here in the U.S. And now again. Um, as we try to ease out of the pandemic era, to see that so many people have rallied in support of Ukraine, 
it really makes me feel, it gives me a warm feeling that there is a sense of global community. It may not be driven by our world leaders, it's being driven by individuals. And, and to see that, I think uh, at this stage, Ukraine has received over 60 million in cryptocurrency donations from just pe random people around the world. And so many others have, have tried to fundraise um, in their own right. I, I think that's, that's perhaps the silver lining to everything we've gone through, that we do care. We are, we are trying to develop or cultivate shared values and rally against these issues. But I just wish it would, could be sustained and that our world leaders could tap into it when yeah, we deal well, with climate change or other issues. Yes, well, I think we might need new leaders for that. <laughs> but uh, that's my personal opinion. Um, anyway, listen, um, listen, Maha, that's been fantastic. I mean, time has flown. I mean, we could go on for hours, I know. Um, all of uh, all of Dr. Ma's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Uh, so I'm a professor at NYU and uh, focused on global risk and future trends. And uh, I work with graduate students, but I also uh, give speeches on this topic to audiences around the world. Um, and uh, of course, I, I feel it's important to share ideas with as many people as possible. So that's why I write the books. But I also think children should be aware of global risk and what they're, you know, what could be next, what role can they play? Because I think to a certain extent, we are all activists now who have to help tackle these global challenges. So I created this comic book called The Global Kid. You're welcome to check it out if you have kids age eight to 12 plus. And it has, in fact, it has virtual reality, augmented reality elements that you use the app. And it's, it's cool. It features my dog who you heard earlier. <laughs> so Excellent. It's, it's good fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like a great book. I think I might do it myself. VR, <laughs> love it. <laughs> definitely check out my book, Global Spring, of if, if of interest, uh, more predictions for how yeah. uh, the world oh. will unfold. And, and where, when, where will your predictions be published when you say your top 10 is coming out oh, soon? Where will uh, that be? That will be on the World Economic Forum uh, website. I can uh, share it with you guys. I'll, I'll follow up with Perfect. you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Listen, thanks again, uh, Maha. This has been fantastic. Such fascinating subjects we've got through. Um, so as usual, people, please subscribe. Please, please leave a comment, especially if something like this. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And and please share share with other people, uh, because what, what Maha has shared with us today is, is fascinating stuff. And we need to have debate. We need to, and that's the other thing I would just say is a really party thing is we need to learn to have debate again. Cause I think that's, if there's one cry, if there's one thing I think casualty of all of this is we have lost the ability to have rational debate and to be able to discuss ideas with people without getting emotional and mm -hmm. ideological or dogmatic or whatever it is. That's so hard. please, please talk to people who have different opinions to you and don't talk at them. Listen and discuss. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you all for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody.